Hello and welcome back to another full snap-by-snap -snap PC build guide and today I'm going to show you how to build a PC in the latest mid-tar case from Cougar, the MX600 RGB. So let's take a look at the other parts I'm going to be building with today. For the motherboard I'm going to be using ASRock's X670E Phantom Gaming Lightning. For the CPU I'm going to be using AMD's Ryzen 9, the 7900X. Keeping our CPU cool I've got a 280mm AIO from Lian Lee, it's the brand new Galahad 2 LCD. For RAM, I've got 32GB of Team Group's Delta RGB DDR5 at 6000 megatransfers per second. For storage, I'm going with a single Gen 5 NVMe drive for this build. It's from Crucial as their T700 in 2TB capacity. I'm going with a fully modular 850W power supply from Cooler Master. It's the V850i Gold Multi. And for the graphics card, I'm going to be using the ASUS ROG Strix RTX 4080. So that's all the parts, let's get building. So as usual I'm going to make a start by preparing our case, so to remove our tempered glass side panel we just need to simply pull it out from the back and then it can be lifted up and away. Just before we remove our other side panel you'll notice we've got this perforated area down at the bottom and that is because we are going to be able to mount intake fans on the power supply shroud, so this is going to give them a source of intake. This panel is removed in exactly the same way as the other side panel, just pull it out from the top and lift it up and away. And then if we take a look at the back of the panel we have just removed, you'll notice that there is a magnetically attached dust filter. And we've got another intake panel on the other side, and this panel is also removable. It's magnetically attached at the top, so just tilt it out and then lift it up. And if we turn the panel around, you'll notice that there is another dust filter on the back of it. But because the dust filter is enclosed on all sides, there doesn't seem to be a way to easily remove this dust filter. On our power supply stride, we've got one of the cases, two case accessory boxes. And this box contains our instruction manual and the vertical GPU bracket, and I'll show you this later on. So we take a look at the front of the case, we've got this perforated panel on it, removing it's really straightforward, we just need to tilt it out and then lift it up and away. Behind this we've got a full length dust filter, and it is possible to remove this dust filter with the front panel in place, it's just a simple matter of pulling it up from the top. So you can see at the front of the case, Cougar have pre-installed three 140mm PWM ARGB fans, Although if you prefer at the front you can obviously mount up to 320mm fans or up to 360 or 280mm radiator. Now these fans are on a removable bracket. To remove the bracket there's a little thumb screw on the inside of the case we're going to need to remove. So you'll notice we've got these two little buttons here on the front of the case. All we need to do is push these down that's going to free up our bracket. Now it is important to mention that these fans are connected up to the fan and the RGB hub at the back of the case and I haven't unconnected them. The reason is I don't want to change the fans here so if you do want to remove this fully you are going to have to disconnect the fans and then it's just going to be a simple matter of lifting the bracket up to free it from the case and it is possible to put this bracket in either this way round or turn it round the other way if you prefer. So I'm just going to put it back into a starting position. Again, there's probably no reason to do it for this particular build, but you do want to remove the rest of the front panel. It's just a simple matter of pulling it off from the bottom. So I'm happy with the standard fans at the front of the case, so I'm just going to put the front panel back in place. Take a look at our case's front I.O. We've got a power button, a button to control the case's built-in ARGB controller. We've got two USB Type-A ports, a single Type-C port, and a combined headphone and microphone jack. On the top of the case we've got a magnetically attached dust filter which can simply be pulled away. And the fan mounting options at the top of the case are exactly the same as the front, up to 3120 or 3140mm fans, or up to 360 or 280mm radiator. So the case's top panel is removable which is going to make mounting a radiator at the top of the case much easier and also gives improved access to the build. To remove it we've got one screw at the back and two screws at each side. Then with the screws removed we should simply be able to slide the panel forwards, tilt it up and lift away. At the rear of the case we've got a 120mm PWM ARGB fan pre-installed, although if you prefer you can mount up to 140mm fan or radiator. On the power supply stride we are able to mount up to two 120mm fans or up to a 240mm radiator and Cougar have a really nice way of mounting this. Most cases you put the fans on and use long radiator screws to screw them down to the bottom of the case, but we've actually got a removal bracket here. So we've just got one screw at the rear of the case that we need to remove. That's then going to free up this bottom bracket, so we just need to pull it forward and we can simply lift it up. So you're then going to be able to mount your fans or radiator to the bracket in standard way, screwing it in from the back with standard screws before sliding it back into place. In terms of motherboard support, the case does support motherboards up to E8X in size, 
and you want to go with the CPR cutter, the maximum height supported is 180 millimeters. So over to the right hand side of the motherboard, we've got this nice cable cover bracket, hiding the cables, plug it into the right hand side of the motherboard. It's in the right place for a standard ATX motherboard. If you want to go with an ATX motherboard, you need to move the bracket towards the front of the case. To do this, there's four screws at the back of the case, which you need to loosen. And this is then going to allow you to slide the motherboard tray towards the front of the case. And then all you need to do is simply tighten the screws at the back to secure it in place. In terms of the graphics card support, at the rear of the case, we've got eight horizontal PCI expansion slot covers. And the maximum length of graphics card supported is up to 400 millimeters. Your graphics card should be well supported in the case with this GPU support bracket. There's a little rubber pad here to protect your graphics card. You simply need to loosen the thumb screw on the bottom and then you're going to be able to slide this bracket up to where it provides support for your graphics card and then tighten up the thumb screw again. You'll notice we've got this solid panel at the front of the power supply stride and you'll notice it is angled up towards the graphics card. So all the intake coming at the front should be directed towards the graphics card, hopefully keeping it nice and cool. So I've already shown you the vertical GPU bracket. The first step in installing it is to remove all the horizontal PCI expansion slot brackets. So there's a little cut it here for you to get your screwdriver through and that's going to let you unscrew the brackets. Next we can take our vertical bracket and we're just going to slot it into place down in the lowest position. And then we'll secure it into place with some of the screws we've just removed. Next we're going to need our box of screws which is in the hard drive cage. And this is really nice, everything is individually sorted into their own compartment. So it's these long standoffs that we're going to need. Then if we look down at the bottom of the power supply stride, you'll notice we've got a range of holes and the holes that you're going to pick depends on which of the slots you want to install your graphics card in and the particular riser cable that you're planning on using. It is important to mention that there isn't a riser cable included with the case, so you are going to have to pick that up at an additional cost. So you're just going to pick the holes that fit for you and screw your standoffs into place. So I'm just going to put them in loosely first of all. And in the screw box we get a standoff insertion and removal tool, so we can simply pop it over the top of the standoff. That's going to let a screwdriver go on and allow us to screw it into place. You can then set your riser cable on top of the standoffs and screw it into place with two of the screws, the little lip around the outside, and these are the same ones you're going to use to secure the motherboard to the case. So if you do want to install your graphics card vertically, there's a few important things to remember. Once you've installed your graphics card, you should be able to put these two slot covers back in place, tidying up the back of the case. You may need to remove the GPU support bracket depending on the length of your card. It's just a simple matter, there's a little screw in here you can loosen, and then that's going to let you remove the bracket altogether. And the other thing, I wouldn't install the riser cable until after you've installed your motherboard and plugged in all the cables at the bottom, because as you can see, the riser cable here is going to block the cables here on the motherboard. I'm planning to install my graphics card in the horizontal position, so I'm going to put things back to the stock position. The only thing I'm going to do is leave the second and third slot cover from the top out, because that's where my graphics card is going to install. On the bottom of the case, we've got a large tray style dust filter, which can simply be pulled out from the back for cleaning. Moving to the rear of the case, we've got this very nice cable cover door which is magnetically attached and assembly pulls open. It is possible to remove this during the building process and to do so it's just a matter of lifting up to remove. So this is our case's built-in fan and ARGB controller. You can notice that our four PWM connectors and four ARGB connectors coming from each of our pre-installed case fans is plugged in, meaning we've got two spare ARGB connectors and two spare PWM connectors. The only thing I'm noticing with our PWM connectors is one of our fans should really be plugged into port number one. You'll notice this port is white, whereas all the rest are black. And for the motherboard to be able to pick up the fan speeds, something needs to be plugged in to here. So all I'm gonna do is unplug one of our fans, and I'm trying to move it up towards the top port, but it's actually stuck. So what I'm gonna to have to do to get it up to the top port is free it up from the cables here. And then if I route the cable straight up from the bottom, we are able to get it plugged in to the hub. But that's gonna mean our motherboard is gonna be able to read the speed of the fans. If we take a look at the top of the hub, you'll see our reset switch is actually plugged in here. And that's why the button on the top of the case is gonna be able to cycle through the RGB effects on the fan hub. Now, if you prefer to have a reset button, the button on the top of the case will be able to have reset functionality. 
if you simply plug that into the front panel connectors on your motherboard. It is going to mean that you are going to have to use motherboard control to cycle through the ARGB effects. So you have a choice, leave this here and use the button on the top of the case to cycle through the ARGB effects. Take this off, plug it into the reset switch on the front panel connectors on your motherboard and then you're going to have reset functionality with that button on the top of the case. But you are going to have to use motherboard control to control the ARGB of anything plugged into the hub. And then taking a look at the cables coming from the hub, we've got a 4-pin PWM connector, a standard 3-pin 5-volt ARGB connector. And if we plug both these into the motherboard, our motherboard is going to be able to control the speed of the fans and also the ARGB effects. We've also got a SATA power cable, and it is really important you plug this into a SATA cable coming from your power supply. If you don't, the hub isn't going to work, so don't forget to do this. So taking a look at the back of the case, in terms of cutouts to the front of the case, these all seem to be in good positions. In terms of rubber grommets, there's only two of them. Um, they're over towards the right-hand side of the motherboard, but the issue with these is they are going to be coupled by the cable cover brackets. So you're not really going to see them anyway. In terms of cable routing space, this actually looks to be pretty good. And in terms of cable management, this looks to be excellent. We've got this central raceway, which is going to help organize all your cables. And we've got Velcro cable straps, not only on this raceway, but over here for your EPS cables and along the top as well. So cable management looks like it should be pretty straightforward. We've got two dedicated two and a half inch drive mounting brackets behind the motherboard. They're each held on with a thumb screw at the top. Once you remove this, you're going to be able to tilt this out, set your drive into place and then screw it in from the other side before returning it to the case. Down at the bottom of the case, we've got our hard drive cage, which has one hard drive cage in it. So in this drive tray, you're going to be able to mount either a three and a half inch or two and a half inch drive. And it is also possible to mount a further two and a half inch drive on top of the hard drive cage. In terms of the power supply, the maximum length supported is 180 millimeters. Uh, obviously with the hard drive cage installed, although if you want to install a bigger power supply, it is possible to remove the hard drive cage. And if we take a look at the back of the case, you'll notice there's no removable power supply bracket. So we are going to have to set our power supply in from the side before screwing it in from the back. We are now ready to start working on the motherboard. We're going to be installing our CPU, the bracket for our CPU cutter, our M.2 SSD and our RAM before we put the motherboard into the case. To open the socket cover, we need to push this lever down and out to bring it all the way towards the middle of the motherboard. And then we're going to simply be able to open the socket cover up. We can then take our CPU, lower it down into the socket. Once we're happy it's sitting correctly in the socket, it's just a matter of closing the socket cover over. And then if we close this lever again, the black bit of plastic pops off. And then we're going to be able to put it in the motherboard box for safekeeping. Next thing to do is install the brackets for our CPU cooler. Because we're installing this on an AM5 motherboard, the first thing we need to do is remove the stock clips. They're each held on with two screws. And then when the screw is removed, these clips should simply lift off. With our CPU cooler, we get these brackets. And you'll notice on the brackets, there is a little arrow pointing towards the CPU, making sure we install these the correct way round. And then we can secure the brackets with the four screws we've just removed. Next, we've got our M.2 SSD, and we need to remove this heatsink. It's held on with two screws. We can then insert our M.2 SSD into the socket at a slight angle. And you'll notice when we flatten it down, the same screw that's going to hold our heatsink in place is also going to secure the drive in place. We've just got some plastic protection in the back of the heatsink to remove. We're now ready to install our RAM and we're going to be installing it in the second and fourth slot along from the CPU. So we can open the clips on both sides. Next, we can line the RAM up with the slot. Once we're happy everything's lined up, it's just some firm pressure to the RAM and it's going to clip into place. Same thing with our second stick. We'll line it up with the slot and again, some firm pressure and it's going to clip into place. Next, we can set the motherboard into the case, line that up with the standoffs at the back. And then we can secure the motherboard to the case using nine of the screws with a little lip around the outside from the case accessory box. Next thing to do is get our case cable plugged in. Our HD audio cable is going to go to this header on the bottom left hand side of the motherboard. So we can go ahead and bring the cable through the cutout, line it up with the header and push into place. And then we'll pull the excess cable through to the back. We've got an ARGB header down at the bottom of the motherboard. So we'll bring the ARGB cable coming from our hub through line it up with a header, push into place, and then again, pull the excess cable through to the back. We've got a system fan header here at the bottom of the motherboard, so we can bring our cable through the cutout, line it up with a header, and push into place. Our front panel connector is gonna go in this header down the bottom right-hand side of the motherboard, so we can bring the cables through the cutout, 
And what you'll notice is we've got a whole load of individual cables to go into specific pins on the header. So it is important to pay close attention to the diagram in the motherboard manual to make sure you're plugging them in to the right pins. So starting off in the bottom row, working from left to right, we've got hard drive LED positive and hard drive LED negative. Moving up to the top row again, working from left to right, we've got power LED positive and power LED negative. And then next to that, we've got our power switch. And again, we'll just pull all the excess cable through to the back. We've got our USB 3.0 header here, so we'll bring the cable through the cutout, line it up with the header, and push into place. And again, pull the excess cable through to the back. Just below that, we've got our Type-C header, so again, bringing the cable through the cutout, line up with the header and push into place, and pull the cable through to the back. Next, we've got our power supply to install, and it is fully modular, coming without any of the cables plugged in. I've gone ahead and plugged in the cables that we are going to need. So this is our USB cable. Not all power supplies will have it, but this allows the power supply to communicate with the motherboard using Cooler Master's Master Plus software. We've got our 24-pin cable. I plugged in a SATA cable because we're going to need SATA power not only for our cases ARGB controller, but also for our AIO. And I've also plugged in two 8-pin EPS cables to provide additional power to our CPU. We're going to need one 8-pin and one 4-pin from one of the other cables. And I've also plugged in a 12-volt type power cable for our graphics card. So this is our power supply's intake fan, and we're going to want to install it facing down the way where it can get cool air from underneath the case. So it's just a simple matter of sliding our power supply into place at the bottom. So I am actually really struggling to get the power supply in with the hard drive cage. Um, I'm not planning on installing any hard drives in this build, so I'm just going to go ahead and remove the hard drive cage. So looking at the bottom of the case, it does look like we're going to be able to actually slide the hard drive cage forward, so that might be all we need to do. So we'll loosen up the screws, slide the hard drive cage to the front of the case, and tighten the screws up again. Okay, so we'll give that another go. And then we can use four of the larger screws from the case accessory box to secure the power supply to the case. We've got our four pin and eight pin EPS connectors at the top left of the motherboard. So I'm going to bring the four pin cable through first and then get it plugged into the header, followed by our eight pin connector. And then we'll just pull the excess cable through to the back. Then we've got our 24 pin connector here, so we'll bring the cable through the cutout, get it lined up with the motherboard, push into place, and then pull the excess cable through to the back. We've got two USB 2.0 headers down at the bottom of the motherboard, so we'll plug the USB cable coming from our power supply into one of these. And again, pull the excess cable through to the back. The last thing to connect up is the SATA cable coming from our case's ARGB and fan controller, and plug that into the SATA cable coming from our power supply. So moving on to installing our AIO, and Leon, they have really simplified this by pre-installing the fans to the radiator, which is an absolutely brilliant idea. It's going to save us a little bit of work. In terms of connecting everything up, both the fans only have one cable coming from them. We've got a 4-pin PWM connector and also an ARGB connector here. And we're actually going to plug both of these cables into a additional cable coming from our pump. If you prefer, you can, of course, plug the PWM connector into your CPU fan header on the motherboard. Um, but the preferred option is actually to allow you Leon Lee's L-Connect to control everything by plugging directly into the pump. So we take a look at the cables coming from the pump. We've got one cable plugged in already and two additional connectors. The one cable is a 4-pin PWM connector and that's going to go into the pump header on our motherboard. So looking at the pump itself, as I've mentioned, there's two additional cables to plug in. We've got this USB Type-C cable here and it's just simply going to push into here. On the other end, we've got this USB cable, which is going to go into USB 2.0 header on our motherboard, allowing Leon Lee's L-Connect to control the I.O. Then we've got this other cable to plug in here. And coming from it, we've got two connectors. Um, one is for the ARGB connector on our fans. The other is for the 4-pin PWM cable. So they're simply going to go into here. And then we've got this SATA cable. And it's just simply a matter of plugging this into the SATA cable coming from our power supply. So I think installing the I.O. is going to be a little bit easier with fewer cables connected to it. So I'm just going to temporarily unplug these cables. 
So because our case is a removable top, we're going to be able to install it to the radiator outside of the case. So I'm just going to center it in the middle. And then I can secure it into place using the included screws and washers. And then we can reattach the dust filter at the top. Just as we set the top panel into place, I'm going to pass the fan cables through the cutout to the back of the case and then lower the case down into place at the top. And then I'm going to slide things backwards and then we can resecure the top panel into place. So now that we've got the I.O. in the case, there's two things I'm not so happy about. I have centered it and I don't think it looks great centered. I think it would look slightly better further towards the back of the case. And the other thing you can see is the dust filter isn't sitting flush at the top of the case. And I think that's probably because I used the washers. So what I'm planning on doing is moving everything slightly towards the back and removing the washers at the same time. Okay, so we'll try the dust filter again. And there we go, that's sitting down lovely and smooth. There's no ripple in it at all. So it was the washers that was giving us the issue. So just before we install our CPU killer, there's two different types of nuts. The ones with the four dots on it are for AM5 and LGA1200, whereas the plain ones without any dots are for AM4 and LGA1700. Okay, so we can see our CPU killer has thermal paste pre-applied, so we can remove the plastic protection from the back. And then we're going to want to line the CPU cooler up with the bracket we've already installed. And Lee and Lee do recommend having the tubes down at the bottom. And then we're going to take the thumb screws with the four little dots on it because we've got an AM5 motherboard here and get one put on to each corner. And then it's just a matter of tightening each of the thumb screws up in turn. So next thing to do is get the four pin PWM cable coming from the pump plugged into the pump header at the top of the motherboard. And then I'm just gonna pass all the excess cable through to the back of the case. I'm also gonna pass the two additional cables we need to connect through from the back. And we'll get them plugged into the side of the AIO. And then again, we'll just route all the cables through to the back. At this stage, we can remove the plastic protection from the AIO. And we can then just tidy up the cables coming out of the pump. And if we want, there's a little Velcro strap that we can put on the cables to help organize them. We can then bring our USB cable coming from the pump through the cutout at the bottom. We're gonna line it up with the header and push into place and pull the excess cable through to the back. Then we just need to get the cables coming from the radiator plugged into the cables coming from the pump. So the four pin PWM connector and then the ARGB connector below. Last thing to do is get the SATA cable coming from the pump plugged into the SATA cable coming from our power supply. We're now ready to install our graphics card. So we need to open the clip on the top PCIe slot. Then we can line our graphics card up with the slot. And once we're happy everything's lined up, it's just some firm pressure to the graphics card and then we can secure our graphics card into place with two of the screws we removed earlier on. Then all I'm going to do is slide our GPU support bracket up to where it is supporting our graphics card and tighten up both the screws. And a really important step is check that the fan and the GPU can spin without catching on the support bracket, which it can do without any problems. Then we can bring our 12 volt type power cable through the cutout at the bottom, line it up with the GPU and push it into place. And then we'll tuck the excess cable through to the back. Okay, last thing to do is some cable management and get the panels back on again.
So that's the build complete. I've gone ahead and set the PC up. If you don't know how to install Windows, the drivers, set up the RGB software, enter the BIOS and update all the BIOS settings, I've made another video on it. I'll put a link to that video in the description. The only thing that video won't show you is how to set up Leon Lee's new Galahad 2 LCD AIO. So what I want to do is spend a little bit of time now showing you how to do that. So because I'm making this video well before launch, I've got a beta version of Leon Lee's L Connect 3. By the time this video comes out, it'll just be the standard L Connect 3 that you can get from Leon Lee's website that you're going to want to install. And you'll find a link to that in the description. So I'm going to go ahead and open the software up. So when we open the Unleash L Connect, we're first of all going to be in the system page. There's a few things we can customize. We can customize the screen itself and all our ARGB effects, or we can go in and control the fan and pump profile. So let's start here. You can see our screen is currently set to white and we've got rainbow on the size. I'll show you how to adjust all that in a minute, but let's start off with our fans. So you can see the fans on the radiator are currently running in the standard profile and around about 900 revs per minute. And you can see this is our fan curve here and the green line indicates where we are based on our current CPU temperature. We can't adjust it here, it's going to have to run off the CPU temperature and that does make perfect sense. So if I go ahead and select the quiet profile, you'll notice that our fan speeds are going to turn down. The fan curve has changed slightly. Um, and what we can do is make adjustments to the fans down here to whatever we want. So we want to run our fans at full speed, we can do that as well. You hear the fan noise will kick up in the background. Our fans are currently going to be running just over 1500 revs per minute. That is obviously going to be quite noisy and you're not going to really want to do that. If you do want to make your own custom fan curve, you can do that as well, dragging these points to wherever you want them and that will save it away. But I think what I'm going to do is just run off the standard fan profile until I've done the thermal testing. There is also the option to sync up with your motherboard if you have plugged the cables into your motherboard headers. Okay, the other thing we can adjust is our pump and for the pump we've got two different options, fixed revs per minute and PWM. If we click on PWM it's going to give us a curve. I much prefer to just fix the speed of the pump itself. And you can see at the moment it's currently running around about um, 2250 revs per minute. We do have the option to pull this up as well so we can pull it up to full speed which is 3600 revs per minute and I can hear the noise really kicking up in the background as I do that. Um, I think in terms of the testing I'm probably just going to run it on the default profile for now so we'll click on default and I can hear the pump noise kicking down in the background and at this level it's pretty much inaudible over the fan noise at the 3600 it's really quite noisy so I think I'm just going to leave everything on the default profile. So let's head over and control the custom screen. So at the moment as I've mentioned the screen is set to white so we have different options in the screen header. We can control the lighting around the outside of the screen and we can also control the lighting on the fans all separately. So let's make a start with the lighting on the screen itself. So at the moment you can see it's currently set to rainbow we can adjust that and we've got two different pages of lighting effects. So let's pick a different one. Let's go for breathing. It's currently set to red and if you look at the AIO you'll now notice that the lighting on the side of it is changed over to a red breathing pattern. We've got a whole range of different effects. We'll click on Meteor here and you'll notice that as we select them they change on the AIO itself. I personally am just after a static white, so let's click on static. That will change it over to a static red. We click here, select white, and click here. And then you'll notice on the AIO itself, it is now a static white. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the fans next of all. You can see they're currently set to rainbow. Um, again, if we want to adjust them, we can do. We've got controls for speed and brightness here and also direction. Let's see a different effect. Let's go for breathing. And again, if you want to change the color, you've got the option to do it here as well. Um, we have a whole range of different effects. Let's go for runway and we've got our two colors here. You want to change those, easy enough to do just in here. Probably just going to go for a static color here. There's two ways I can select the color that I want through here. Or what I can do is actually sync it up with the screen LED, which probably does make sense. Uh, I've set that to a static white on either side. So if I click sync here, 
we can select the size of the IO that we've got. We've got a 280, and what you'll notice, the fans have now changed to white, syncing up with whatever we change the lighting on either side of the screen to. Okay, so now we come on to the exciting bit, the screen itself. So at the moment, you can see it is just set to a static white. Um, that's the background color. So if we click on the background color, we can change what we have it to. So at the moment, it's a solid color. If I want to change that to a black, for example, select black, select here, and you'll notice that the background of the screen changes to a black. We can, of course, change it from a solid color to some sort of gradient. So there's a horizontal gradient. And we can pick the colors that we want that to be on. Vertical gradient or a radial gradient. We've got the options to flip it. We can add text over the top of this. So if we click on the text, we can choose what we're gonna have. And this is where we're gonna get our sensor panel. We can, of course, have things like the time. But if you want to display your system information, this is probably the best place to get it. So let's click on the slider sensor. And then we've got our different effects that we can choose. So I'm going to go and display all of these. So that's going to then display our system information on the AIO. At the moment, it's looping quite slowly. It's in 20 seconds. So I want to show you this. So let's pick three. And what you'll notice now is that it will work quite quickly through the different temperatures, changing every three seconds to just show us some different information. So I don't think that looks particularly great on the background of just a static color. There is lots of other effects that we've got here. So let's, for example, go with the time tunnel. You can see I think that looks much better on that background. We could try the Mandela. Again, it's, it's probably going to be difficult to see over the top of that one. What about the twist hole? That looks like quite a nice one. So let's go into the text here. Let's go for our slider sensor and select all the items. And make it three seconds. So I think this definitely looks much better than just a solid color. We've got all our system information with a really cool background. If you want to have something more simple, for example, just the time, we can do that. And again, if you want to change the color of that, we can do that as well. So let's select white. Rather than having any standard background color, you can add an image or a video in. So let's go over to this. Um, by default, we've got the Leon Lee logo. Um, and again, with it in the background, I think this looks pretty cool, but there is other effects that we can add over the top of it. So let's pick the raining. And you'll notice then it, we've got a rain effect over the top of the Leanne Lee logo. We can also do things like fireworks. Or you can add your own custom image or video. To add your video, just click on add. And then you've got a choice of a screen recording, screen capture, or upload. And what's really good is it's standard MP4s or picture files that you can upload. So let's click here. I've added a few items into my pictures. So let's add just a couple, my logo. What we're going to have to do here is select what we want appearing. So I'm just going to select the whole screen. Click here and import. And then if you look at the I.O., it's now displaying my logo as an image. We can add video files, so let's try something different. I've got my um, intro here. We'll click on it. And how this works is it is going to play stuff in the background. You're only going to be able to select a certain part of the screen to display. So this is as wide as I can make it because obviously the AIO is a screen and I've recorded this in a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. So we can drag this to the middle of the screen. And what we're going to have to do is click on play and then click on record here. It's going to make a recording of what is showing in the middle of the screen here. When it's finished, we have to click on stop. And then if we click the tick here and import, it's going to import this screen recording to the AIO. 
So we take a look at the AIO now. My intro is now playing on the AIO. Not perfect, but it is cutting the website address off because it didn't quite fit into the screen recording that I have, and it's just going to play that in a loop. Now let's see, can we upload a slightly bigger file? So we'll try something different. I do have um, a video of me actually building a PC, so let's try and see can it open. It is quite a big file, it's a 4K video file, so it's gonna take a little bit of time. And again, I'm gonna to have to only be able to record in a square, so we'll drag that to the center of the screen. And the maximum that we're able to record is three minutes. Okay, so we'll start the video. And we'll get to the bit that I want to start recording at, so let's start here. Okay, and we'll call it here, that's about a minute. Um, and then we just need to click the tick button here and import. So there we go, if we look at the I.O. now, the video is playing of me actually building a PC. So I do think this is really cool, having up to three minutes of a normal video file and being able to use an MP4 without having to convert it is absolutely brilliant. But I think what I'm gonna do now is just go for the standard Lian Lee logo with the raining effect. To cycle through the cases built in ARGB effects, it's just a simple matter of pressing the button on the top of the case and it cycles through each of the effects in turn. To sync up with your motherboard, you just need to hold the button in for three seconds. The lights will flash and then it will sync up to whatever your motherboard is set to. In this case, it's set to rainbow. And to turn all the lighting off, it's just a matter of holding the button in for six seconds. The lights will flash and then go off and then you simply just need to press the button again to get the light back on again. So what I'm gonna do now is some thermal testing and then I'm gonna be back with the case review. So you wanna hear what I actually thought about the Cougar MX600 RGB. You're gonna to wanna to check out that video and I'll put a link to it in the description. If you have enjoyed this build guide, please remember to give it a thumbs up and if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button as well. Thanks for watching.